Hello, everybody. My name is Wesley Wolfbear Pinkham. I am the Senior Visual Arts Manager here at FCNL. It's so good to see all of your faces on this great Thursday day. We still have some people coming in, so I'll just give a quick moment, allow the, uh, the great team here that's admitting people. We are here at our very first General Secretary Report event. Um, very, very honored and excited to have General Secretary Bridget Moikes and Clerk Mary Lou Hatcher here. Uh, looks like we're having a nice uh, trail off of people coming in, so I think we can start this conversation. I'm going to... still more people coming in, so they'll, they'll come in and uh, join the conversation. I'm going to pass it over to Mary Lou uh, Hatcher. Let's see... Uh, should have asked you to unmute. Can you hear me, Mary Lou? Yes, got you. Hi, Mary Lou. All right, uh, passing it over to you and uh, our friend Bridget. Well, welcome everyone. It's exciting to be with you today. We are um, we're celebrating 80 years here at FCNL. Our work for peace and justice is pretty exciting. And one of the things that we're doing in this 80th year is making a shift from a quarterly report that is basically um, a long written document that the executive committee would review to, to this more lively conversation on a quarterly basis with our broader um, engaged community. So I think there are general committee people here and advocates and donors and representatives from meetings and churches and and welcome to everyone, whatever your relationship is with FCNL. So we're happy to offer this, you know, first of many quarterly reports. And with that, we pass it over to our fearless leader, Bridget Moix. Thank you, Mary Lou. Hello, friends. It's so good to see you. Um, I was just scrolling through the faces and always wonderful to see longtime friends and new friends and soon to be friends on the calls here. As Mary Lou said, we really want to use this time, which is brief together, to share a little bit about what's been happening um, in this new format for the report. But also, my hope is to have questions and conversation with you all and really um, address the issues you want to hear about. So I thought I would start with a little brief um, summary of some of the information that you have been receiving and will receive after this call as well. In written form, we have a new written document um, that is both a short summary of around three pages that should have arrived in your email yesterday, I think, or today perhaps. And then there'll be, um, particularly for general committee members, there will be a longer document that'll be coming that's around 18 pages, so still much shorter than the 70 pages we used to produce, um, and that will be hopefully easier for you to access and digest. I am joining you from Richmond, Indiana, zooming in from where it all began for FCNL 80 years ago this year when friends came together um, to bring a voice for peace to Capitol Hill. Very happy um, to be here on Earlham's campus for a Quaker leadership conference that's coming. I want to summarize a few of the points that are in the report. Um, I want to first though say thank you to everyone who is part of FCNL's community, um, all of our supporters, donors, advocates, committee members, um, Prayer, prayerful participants who keep us in the light and hold this work that is really only possible because of all of you and all of the people that are engaged with us. So thank you so much. In terms of the last um, three quarters, because we took a pause to reformat, so we're going to catch you up on what's been happening since um, last, really since annual meeting probably for a lot of you. We have now begun a new Congress. The 118th Congress uh, began with new legislative priorities for FCNL that the General Committee approved. And we have been working, our lobbying team has been working to develop our change strategies and focus our work around one of our big goals, um, which is strengthening our lobbying in ways that help bridge partisan divides. So on all the issues that we work on, we've really been looking at how can we do our work in a way that brings people together across such a polarized political environment. 
And we've already seen one very important success, which I hope some of you have heard about already, which was that the Senate voted for the first time to repeal the 2002 Iraq authorization for the use of military force. Give your all yourselves a big round of applause for that. That is years of work, um, a lot of uh, hard work by our network around the country and lobbyists here in DC. I know Heather Brandon Smith um, was given a big round of applause when she walked into a coalition meeting after that vote because of her leadership role. So that was a huge success. It passed the Senate um, with a very strong bipartisan vote of 66 to 30. And um, we'll continue to work on that now on the House side and hope to get that over the finish line this Congress. Uh, another big area of our work, as you know, has been working to strengthen our commitment around anti-racism, anti-bias, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. This has been a very important focus for FCNL for a number of years. And part of what we've done over the past a few uh, months and quarters, I guess, um, has been to build up our capacities both within our staff with the creation of a new department called Community and Culture. And many of you heard, if you were at annual meeting, you heard from Lauren Brownlee, our new Associate General Secretary for Community and Culture. She led a wonderful panel discussion uh, around these issues. And so that work internally in the organization has continued to evolve and grow. And at the same time, our work externally on this has been uh, developing too. So we had our spring lobby weekend in March, um, which is one of the highlights of our year. And it focused on violence interrupters and getting more federal funding for the violence interrupters program. We had 336 young people attend. 321 of them were in person in Washington with us and a handful online. Uh, and around 65% of those participants were first time lobbying, which is wonderful to bring that many new people into the halls of Congress on this issue. And over 40% of them identify as either black, indigenous, or people of color. So our young adult program is bringing in such a rich, diverse community of young leaders to enhance and strengthen our lobbying. Another area, um, big strategic focus for us is about ensuring good stewardship of all of our resources. Um, this is from human resources, most important, the people that we work with and do this work, um, financial, physical, our buildings and facilities, um, the spiritual resources that we have to bring to this work. And one of the big developments, as many of you know, has been the opening of Friends Place on Capitol Hill. It reopened um, a year ago about and has hosted over a thousand guests. And just since this fiscal year, we've hosted 61 groups for overnight lodging. A lot of these are student groups or peace and justice groups that are coming to do different kinds of advocacy or different policy work. We are high on the list of the Girl Scouts. They use Friends Place um, to bring Girl Scouts to Washington and are getting to learn about FCNL and who we are and what we do in the process. And we've also, as you know, been hosting migrants um, since the busing of migrants from uh, Texas and um, Arizona started last year. Uh, Friends Place was just newly opened and Sarah Johnson was already very connected with the Mutual Aid Network in Washington, DC. And she said, of course, we will open our doors and uh, our hospitality, provide Quaker hospitality um, to migrants who are coming to Washington. So we've hosted now at this point, uh, I know over 620 migrants have come through um, the doors of, of Friends Place. And that's been a wonderful uh, gift uh, and opportunity to serve and to link that to our advocacy on migration justice, of course, which is also um, ongoing and um, will need a lot of work this year. And then um, one other area that I wanted to mention that has been a focus for us in this year, and we kind of think of this year as a gap year because our forward plan, our last strategic plan ended, our new strategic plan is on the way. And so we've had these goal areas um, helping to guide our, our work this year. And one of them has been really thinking about how do we integrate our work and improve our communication and collaboration across the different parts of FCNL 
we are a large and complex organization now with a big network, uh, advocacy teams all around the country, um, young adults, um, community and culture work, our lobbying in DC. So how do we make sure that all of these different parts of the organization really work together well and collaborate? So toward that end, over the last uh, few quarters, we've been working to integrate teams internally. This includes a uh, community and culture team, which I mentioned that brings young adults and our Quaker leadership, Quaker engagement work together, and also our friends place work together. And then our policy and advocacy team, we've put our strategic advocacy, so that's our grassroots organizing and our lobbyists here in Washington into a broader team that works together more now. And that is really helping to strengthen our impact and think about how do we mobilize the outside the Washington and inside the Washington work to be most effective. So that's been a, a big part of that integration work. We are, of course, as I said, also in the process of strategic planning. And so a big part of our work, particularly with our governors and with a working group of staff and governors that is working now to develop our next five-year strategic plan, has been to begin to gather input. And so we really want to have a strategic plan for the future of FCNL that brings in the voices of many people and the perspectives of Quaker meetings, the perspectives of our young adults, the perspectives of communities who are impacted by the policies that we are working on. So we are engaged in a strategic planning process, which will lead to a plan being brought to the general committee in November at annual meeting for its consideration and approval. And Mary Lou has been a big part of that process. So I wonder, Mary Lou, if you'd like to just say a word about where that stands and how people can get involved. Mm -hmm. Well, right now we are <clears throat> paused at the big, big, broad data gathering stage. And that, um, that includes all of you. So some of you, many of you have already responded to a survey that was sent out broadly to FCNL supporters. And um, thank you for responding. If you have not, the link to that's gonna go into the chat and you can also probably find it in your backlog of email where you put it to save until you had a lot of really good think time. It'll probably take you about 20 minutes to do. It asks you to think about what are the strengths of FCNL right now? Where could we be growing? What are some of the challenges in the world out there that we wanna meet? And how are we best suited as an organization, FCNL, to meet those challenges? So your perspective on these things is really vital and important as we try to shape that plan. And I would just ask you to take a really deep breath and pause before you begin it and to bring your, your deepest self and your best discernment to this because it will shape our work for the next five years. So that's, that's so important, friends, and thank you for participating in it. Great. So I think we want to have some questions and discussion, and I see one already in the chat, and I know Stephen's going to help us find questions in the chat. So feel free to keep posting them there um, and we can um, try to answer questions as they come. But I saw that Florence, hi Florence. I think I saw you on the screen. Um, Florence was a lobbyist when I was an uh, intern at FCNL. So asked about addressing, are we addressing the rise of Christian nationalism? And if so, what approaches are we using? We are working with a number of interfaith networks, Florence, that are uh, looking at how to do this. Um, we're focused on how do you do that in the sense of policy work in Congress, but these interfaith networks are looking at how to build both um, the work of Christian groups to counter you know, the idea of Christian nationalism and extremism, and also um, interfaith work. So there's a summit coming up in May called the um, One America Movement, and we're going to be attending that. It's an interfaith movement that is bringing people together across uh, polarized partisan divides to try to say, what does a faith community do to address these big issues in our country, including the rise of Christian nationalism? So I'm looking forward to learning more from them and what they're doing and the approaches they're taking. Um, they are less focused on policy work and um, lobbying, but um, obviously we're, we work with them a lot in the advocacy space. And then the other group is called Circle of Protection. And that is an explicitly Christian 
a uh, group that does advocacy, particularly around budget issues. As you, the budget right now, as you know, is the big debate in Washington, and it's shaping a lot of what we will do. And so they are trying to bring a, a voice that is very clear of, you know, speaking as Christians for the needs of people who um, are, you know, facing injustice in our community, facing lack of resources. They did a huge amount of work on the child tax credit that we did a lot of work on them and trying to make sure that Congress knows this is the Christian Christianity that we understand. <laughs> this is what um, Jesus calls us to, not Christian, na Christian nationalist approaches. So thinking about that, there's a few other colleagues in that network, particularly Barbara uh, Williams Skinner, um, who has and Jim Wallace, who have explicitly said, how do we counter Christian nationalism more directly as a network? So more to come on that probably, but definitely it is uh, in the in the work that we're doing, we're we're sort of dealing with those issues. It's hard to get at legislatively, I would say. Great. Are there other questions? Yes, uh, we got another question in the chat directed uh, toward you, Bridget. Um, and that's from Dot Mason, who says, um, great to hear about Friends Place. And her question is, how does the work there feed into or complement our overall advocacy? Great question. Hi, Dot. Great to see you. Um, yes. So overall, our advocacy um, work is we're discovering there's huge opportunity for strengthening it with Friends Place. Friends Place is really designed as a civic engagement hospitality space. So it's explicitly for groups who are coming to Washington already with some leaning toward learning about policy or learning about what happens in Washington. We can then offer lobby trainings to any of those groups. And we do, we are doing that. We'll be doing more of it. We are also beginning to, to design our own programs. So um, the first program that Friends Place will explicitly hold to bring people in to do advocacy uh, with us in Washington um, is being planned now. And we look to develop more and more programs so that the ability to, to have a space where up to 40 people can be housed in Washington right on Capitol Hill uh, Friends Place is just a few blocks from the Capitol, um, really opens up a lot of opportunities for us to think about partnerships where we are doing, bringing more and more people, partic particularly young people, into our advocacy work overall. Um, I would also say that on the migration piece, because that's shaped so much of what we've done this year in a lot of ways, um, unexpectedly, we didn't plan that. Um, but we have been able to do lobby visits with congressional offices. Um, one other update, Anika Forrest, our lead, actually our domestic uh, policy director now, and she's led the migration justice program for a number of years. She and I went to the border in October to learn about what was happening with migration. Came back, were, were then set up visits with congressional offices where we talked about what we saw on the border um, Friends Place, Sarah Johnson joined those lobby visits um, to talk about what the experience of is has been in, in providing hospitality for migrants in Washington and to advocate then for a more humane welcome and care system for migrants and um, you know, a just migration system that actually works. So that's been really powerful and um, again was not something we planned but felt like way opened in some pretty exciting ways. So I think we still have a lot to see about how Friends Place will open new opportunities and avenues with our advocacy. Wonderful. Uh, Bridget, we have another question uh, that I think is directed toward you. Um, what are, this is from Doug Bender, who says, what are the behind the scenes opportunities for bipartisan advocate, advocacy in this very divided government? That's a great question. And I've actually been thinking a lot and realizing even as I've now been in this position for a little over a year. And so back in the environment of Capitol Hill, much more than I was before, that there is a lot more opportunity and also hunger on Capitol Hill for space and opportunity for bipartisanship than you see in the media. I was just talking, I was in Louisville and I was talking to folks there about this. And they said, you know, all we see on the television is division in Congress. Well, just this week, I was at a reception that we 
uh, supported, uh, co-hosted uh, on the Farm Bill. We're not focused heavily on the Farm Bill, but it has SNAP benefits and some climate provisions that are very important in it. And our friends at Bread for the World and other interfaith groups um, put together a congressional event uh, on it. And so we supported that and we're part of it. And there was Senator Sabanow from Michigan, Senator um, Bozeman from Arkansas, Senator Braun from Indiana, a bipartisan uh, group of senators up there on the podium, one after another, talking about that no child in the US or around the world should go hungry and that they were committed to working bipartisan and that this was an issue that um, was not you know, was not going to be taken down by partisanship. So there is, there are things happening in Congress already in a bar bipartisan manner. The work we saw and on the AUMF was another really clear example where um, people came together across the aisle with a clear agreement that Congress should reclaim its authority to uh, declare war and that that is not a partisan issue. And we're, we hear, and we've been talking behind the scenes to different congressional offices and asking them, you know, what do you need? It's so polarized. We're a nonpartisan Quaker lobby. What can we do? And they have said, yes, we need more spaces um, where we can talk out of the limelight when the cameras are not on us. Because when the cameras are on, they are feeding <laughs> the media and the media wants the conflict. They want the division. And people in Congress, the staff and the members, they want a space where they can actually problem solve on policy. You know, many, many of them are frustrated with the system not working. There was a poll recently by a congressional, uh, an organization that does research on Congress that found 75% of congressional staff that they talked to, and they talked to a lot of key congressional staff, said Congress is not working as it should. That you know this problem, they want Congress to work. So there is, I think, real opportunity for FCNL um, to do even more than what we're doing now in terms of helping bring people together for policy-focused discussions that do not have to be driven by polarized party politics. Wonderful. Uh, we have a message here from Jonathan Brown. I was pleased to read in Friends Journal that FCNL and AFSC signed on to a letter calling for an end to U.S. military aid to Israel. Any encourage any um, response to that, Bridget? Yes, I was encouraged as well, Jonathan, because that is not that is a difficult issue to get um, traction on, as you know. And we were very happy to sign that letter um, and to be clear about it. And there is not a lot of hope that we can do. Um, a lot in Congress this year on it specifically, but um, I think we'll keep speaking out on that and working as we can. And on on Middle East and military aid to the Middle East broadly, you know, there has been a lot of progress with Yemen and Hassan is going to be working um, to look at both, not just the war powers resolution, but also what's called a 502B authority that would start to look at um, the role of aid and human rights abuses and how to rein in aid and, and with where human rights abuses are involved um, even more in relation to Yemen. And so I think that has relevance in terms of just trying to get Congress to pay attention to human rights standards when it comes to military aid, um, which is an important part of that argument around Israel as well. We have a question from Indiana, Philip Goodchild. Uh, very encouraging to hear about efforts to strengthen lobbying and ways to bridge the partisan divide. This is a challenge in Indiana where there's a supermajority uh, holding sway. Any learnings at the national level that can be shared with us in the states would be most welcome. Mm. Well, we've actually been asking what we need to think about and understand more that's happening at the state level. So. <laughs> We should probably talk more, but I think that, at least from my perspective, part of what I've seen over the past year is we've been trying to think more and more about what is FCNL's role, is that I've actually started trying to not even talk about bipartisanship as much as I talk about nonpartisanship, and really focus on faith values and the role of the faith community and the faith voice as having moral 
integrity in this space. Um, and to, that I think that uh, people of faith, Quakers have that, can have that moral integrity voice and need to exercise it because um, it is one of the voices that I think can um, pierce through the polarization, bring people together, um, be able to speak to a situation where it seems like only one side is being heard. So I guess my the advice is just that, you know, that voice of um, friends and others in Indiana, um, people of faith in Indiana, who can speak to, you know, people of all political persuasions is going to be very, continue to be very important. All right, we have a few, just a few minutes more. If there are any other questions or thoughts. The big, big one here from uh, Gray Fox, Gray Cox, excuse me, in, in Maine um, about artificial intelligence. Any response there, Bridget? Yes, I just see that. And the idea that partisan views haven't um, coalesced. It's interesting. I think I've been, I mean, we are now, as you are, hearing so much about this. Um, it's worth us thinking about. I think we're not in a position where we're well equipped um, now with expertise or knowledge to lean into it too much. But um, certainly it is going to be a continuing issue that cuts across so much of what we do. And what are, you know, I think for Quakers, we've also been a voice that has said as new technologies have developed or thoughts about the, um, you know, the, I think about the law and the sea and other things, Quakers thinking about what is the use of something? Are we using the common goods or the new technology for good or for ill? And how are we going to shape how people think about the use of new technologies and um, how to direct them to harm less and help more. But I don't have a very good answer for you yet, Gray. There's one last question. If we have time for another question here, uh, there are more, but one more you could get to is about uh, Ukraine and uh, what FCNL's position is there and uh, an update on that work. Yes, sure. Thank you. That's a really important one. Um, yes, we have been working to advocate for increased focus and attention on a diplomatic path out of the crisis and ending the war rather than uh, trying to continue to win or escalate it. Um, there's more space now for people because the war has shown that it's, it's not going to end soon. Military experts are saying it's not going to end on the battlefield. We're going to have to have a political settlement at some point. Um, so why don't we try to get that as soon as possible to reduce the harm that's happening? Um, it's going to have to, though, eventually deal with the security in the whole region of Europe, which has not been dealt with since the end of the Cold War in terms of how are Europe, is Europe and Russia going to live together and how are we going to reduce fear and aggression and actually create a system of security for everyone? So that for now, we're really pushing for more attention by Congress to both um, supporting all efforts at diplomatic channels out, where particularly where the Ukrainians are able to um, lead that, uh, what eventually needs to be a peace process, and also and keeping all the channels of, of possible negotiation and dialogue logue open, and also uh, greater congressional oversight on all the military aid that has gone and continues to go because there's been very little oversight on it. Um, we did a big push on no cluster munitions to Ukraine because the US was going to be uh, sending cluster munitions, which we know hurts more civilians. So a lot of work to do there. We're, we're keeping in touch occasionally with Friends House Moscow as well to try to make sure we understand um, what's happening with people in the region, uh, both in Ukraine and broader Europe where the refugees are, and also in Russia itself. Well, thank you all so much. I just want to, we've come to the end of our time. I see there's some other quotes and a good book uh, and video uh, recommendation that I'm going to check out. I just wanted to say thank you again to all everyone for all your support, um, all your financial support, advocacy support, spiritual support, committee work support, 
um, FCN, you are FCNL, and we are so grateful um, that you are part of our community. So thank you so much, friends. See you again soon. <laughs>